Indiana women's basketball beat Michigan State 94-85 in their first Big Ten tournament matchup. Indiana came out of the gates slow in the first half, but they looked like a completely different team coming out of the halftime break. We needed to fix our minds. That was it. You know, we just needed to fix our attitude. We needed to fix our minds. Uh, as I said, I thought we slept walk in the first quarter, came out slow, um, and, uh, you know, was uncharacteristic of our basketball team. Obviously, uh, we're not proud of how we came out in that first half. I don't think any of us are. But the fact that we were able to kind of weather the storm a little bit and keep our foot on the pedal, keep chipping away at the hole we dug ourselves um, was really special. But uh, that's not going to fly down the stretch here in this big country, so we got to learn from it. we got to be better. It was a homecoming for Minnesota native Sarah Scalia. She knocked down 18 points off the bench. While she'd been in this building before as a fan watching the Minnesota Lynx, this was her first time out there playing on the court. I'm from here, and a lot of my family lives here, so... Mainly just a lot of family and then some friends um, throughout high school. And uh, obviously playing in my home state um, where I grew up in, it's, it's something special. And she's willing to do whatever it takes and I think that speaks volume of her character. Just um, her willingness to defend, her willingness to hit up her shots um, has been really special to see and uh, I'm glad she's a Hoosier. Indiana will play Ohio State tomorrow at 1.30 Central Time in the semifinals. From Minneapolis, Alex Hines, IOS TV Sports. Free throws were key for Indiana down the stretch. They shot 94% on the game, and there were two key trips down the stretch, one from Chloe Moore McNeil, and then another one from Mackenzie Holmes, where she made two shots to tie the game up at 83, with just a second and a half to play. Terry Moran's Indiana squads have always prided themselves on the defensive side of the ball. There's no more striking example than the third quarter, in which they held the Boilermakers to only two points in a 10 minute period. While a lot of things went right for the Hoosiers on the night, it was the rebounding that stood out most. They held the Riverhawks to only two second chance points. This kind of stifling defense is something they've been working on in practice. Indiana women's basketball is back. And while stars Grace Berger and Mackenzie Holmes are returning to the squad, there are several new faces to look forward to this year. Here are three of them. First is Oregon transfer Sydney Parrish. The former Miss Indiana basketball is back in state and poised to be a key bench performer for the Hoosiers. She provides a three-point outlet while also being a scrappy defender for a team who prides itself on its defense. Freshman Yarden Garazon is no stranger to playing at a high level, having played several years amongst the Israeli pro ranks. She made her presence felt in her Indiana debut with a team leading 19 points and five threes. It's her all-around balanced play, however, that impresses most. With the ability to play just about anywhere, she'll be looking to lock up a spot in the starting five. Minnesota transfer Sarah Scalia was one of the best three-point shooters in the Big Ten last season, scoring 111 of them. She averaged 18 points per game last season and could continue to be a prolific scorer for a team that has needed consistent three-point shooting. With these newcomers alongside a strong returning cast, it's shaping up to be an exciting season of women's basketball in Bloomington. Alex, what will be the key for IU to win? I think besides Mackenzie Holmes, who at this point has kind of established herself as a 20-point machine mm -hmm. on the offensive side, Grace Berger had a slow scoring day against Minnesota with some good ball handling and assists. I think her and Parrish need to keep what they've been doing going and really just take a hold of this game because they can't let it slip early. And they're a veteran team too and when they played in Purdue last time around it was a close overtime thriller. Indiana pulled away but those Purdue players, many of them on the starting lineup this weekend, will have played in that game right. and will know what it's like to play in front of a large home crowd and play against a top ranked Indiana team so I think that's going to help them as well and they've had really good performance and to beat Ohio State is still a big feat even if they were on a slide so right. a lot of momentum. Well I think overall it's all been a good thing I think the whole purpose of speeding up the game is getting more action going on for the fans watching and there's less dead air and I think it's done that I think the pitch clock hasn't really been too big of an issue um, I think you know I think we're seeing like less than one uh, violation per game for like pitchers and batters so it's overall not really been something people notice too much. So I think it's a subtle adjustment in the end that's going to just better the game overall. I'm going to go with the AL West because I think you've got two really good teams that made the postseason last year. You've got the Astros, the world champions, of course. The Mariners still look really good with that young core. 
Rodriguez, obviously in center field rookie of the year. You've got Gilbert, you've got Kirby, you've got Castillo, and that pitching staff looks really good. But you also have two teams that could do something. The Rangers, they spent so much money. I mean, it's like $800 million committed to players right now. It's, it's ridiculous. DeGrom, can he stay healthy? Can you get what you need out of Seager and Simeon, et cetera? And then the Angels, will they finally get over the hump? Mm. Will Otani make a postseason? Will Trout finally play more than the, I think, three games he's played in the postseason is in his career? I think all four of those teams are really capable of making the postseason and making enough of a run, uh, except the Oakland days. Well, I think Josh mentioned a potential good one between the Dodgers and the Padres. I'm going to go just slightly different. I'm going to go Mets and Braves, two teams that fought down to the last last year for that division title. I think they'll do it again. Both teams, I think, got better which I think is you know ridiculous when you consider how good they were. The Mets pitching staff looks great if they can stay healthy. I feel like that's just the mantra for the Mets at this point. Um, and the Braves just look so consistently good. Mm. Spencer Strider last year was absolutely insane to watch. Uh, the strikeouts he's able to get at such high rates. I think they're going to fight for it. And when you consider that the Phillies and Marlins aren't going to be that easy to beat, it's going to be a really tight race down the stretch for a division crown and even for where they finish in the wild card. I'm going to go with the Twins. They were close mm. fighting in that division with the Guardians for a little bit before the Guardians flew away with it and the Twins kind of tanked. Um, but, I mean, Pablo Lopez, Kevin, you mentioned a big addition to that team. I think the pitching staff looks a lot more shored up. Joe Ryan as their ace actually has looked pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Kenta Maeda coming back from injury as well. I think overall their team looks great if they can have a little bit of a boom. They've got a lot of boomer bust guys. I mean, no, no better example than Joey Gallo. Um, three true outcomes galore. But I, I think if they can, they, if they can just get going a little bit, it's not the strongest division. I think they have room to push through uh, and actually win the division crown because I don't think they're going to make it as wild card.